Another distinction to keep in mind is true versus false aneurysm. True aneurysms contain all layers of the vascular wall, the intima, media, and adventitia, also called the externa. As depicted by the markings on the landing strip, purple for intima, red for the smooth muscle of the media, and tan for adventitia. False aneurysms, or pseudoaneurysms, on the other hand, don't include all the layers. One example of this is seen in the setting of vascular trauma. When rupture of the intima causes the formation of a periarterial hematoma encased in adventitia, we're going to stick with true aneurysms, however. And the most common place to find one of these is in the abdominal aorta. Also, you see how we've placed the bulge underneath those kidney-esque pulleys? Abdominal aortic aneurysms, or AAAs as they're called, are usually found in the infrarenal aorta, below the renal arteries, in other words. Which is a good thing, because when it does involve the renal arteries, which occurs in about 5% of cases, the overall prognosis is worse. This can lead to kidney injury, and treatment is much more difficult. Now, the whole point here is that we need an initial injury, something that causes a localized weakness in the vessel wall so that it starts expanding. In the case of AAA, the pathologic mechanisms of aneurysm development and progression aren't fully understood and are probably multifactorial. Nevertheless, we do know what risk factors contribute to aneurysm formation. The big one to remember is atherosclerosis. It turns out that many patients diagnosed with AAA will also have coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease at presentation. Not only that, athromatous plaques are commonly found right inside the aneurysm. Here's where it gets a little hazy. It's logical to think that the plaque itself is responsible for the initial aortic injury that leads to aneurysm formation. You've got all the ingredients. There's local inflammation. Throw in some metalloproteinase and elastase activity. Maybe even some cell necrosis. You know, all that stuff we covered in our atherosclerosis treasure hunt sketch. And bam! A weakened and dilated aorta. Studies increasingly show, however, that atherosclerosis may occur in parallel with aortic aneurysms, rather than directly cause it. In other words, these two processes share many risk factors, and thus can occur together. The most prominent risk factors include age, cigarette smoking, and male sex, all of which are embodied by Commander Wetcalf. Just look at all those ribbons and medals and semen regalia all over a shirt. I could have used better phrasing. What I'm getting at here is, this guy's been around for a while which is pretty fitting because the incidence and prevalence of abdominal aortic aneurysm is pretty insignificant in populations under the age of 60. It's pretty rare in women as well. The prototypical patient is a 65 to 80 year old Caucasian man. In fact, five to 10% of patients in this demographic will have a AAA. Not only is the amount of smoking correlated with the risk of developing AAA, it's also associated with larger and more dangerous aneurysms. So talk to your patient about smoking cessation. Quitting will decrease the odds of developing a AAA, with the greatest benefit among those who have quit for more than 10 years. Unfortunately, the odds never return to baseline, suggesting that some degree of vessel damage inflicted by smoking is permanent. 